Dear world, we need to talk. Welcome to Doha Debates, where we are searching for solutions to global challenges. It is clear that there is a growing deficit of trust between people and political establishments. They're not working for the average American citizen. We do not fact check politicians' speech. We want the system to stop down. We have a lot of people who are not citizens. We have a lot of people who have political An unprecedented wave of protests around the world, fueled by people's anger and frustration with government. Millions of people continue to demand radical change, leaving political leaders often blindsided and out of touch. But this isn't about ideology. It's about loss of faith in government, in political systems, in elites and institutions. So can we restore trust in our traditional systems or should we find other ways of self-governance? That is our debate here at the Peace Forum. Please welcome your Doha Debates moderator, Hida Fakhri. Well, hello and welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Doha debate at the Paris Peace Forum. Bonsoir à toutes et à toutes. Today, as you know, our focus will be on the loss of trust in government. As you look around, turmoil pretty much everywhere in the world, whether it was in France a few months ago, in Chile today, Algeria, Haiti, Hong Kong, whether you look towards Lebanon, Iraq and Sudan and so many other places. People are out on the streets demanding radical change. They're protesting against political corruption and economic and social injustice. They want new leaders. They also want new forms of leadership. The latest research tells us that three quarters of the world's governments are mistrusted by their own people and that we, as citizens, are losing faith in just about everything. So with public confidence in governments and other institutions at these historic lows, what is the solution? What is the best way forward? Can trust be restored or do other systems of governance need to be propped up? Do we need to just revamp and re-engineer what we have? Or perhaps technology can lend a hand and can change the way we are all governed. Well, we have with us three speakers here today, each one of them with a very different way of looking at this relationship between people and government. Each one of them will have just three minutes to make their case. And then we'll be heading into our majlis, and this is where we will try to flesh the arguments out and see whether we can indeed bridge any of the differences. So once again, a very warm welcome to you all. We are live from the Paris Peace Forum. We're also live streaming on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. But first off, before we kick off this debate, let's go straight to our correspondent, Nelufar Hedayat, to tell us how you can all get involved. Nelufar. Hida, thank you so much. Yes, as ever, we have our studio audience waiting, ready to vote and to hear our speakers' compelling remarks. But we want to hear from you. I want to know what you think. Get in touch with your thoughts, your comments, your views on anything that's being said or not said live on stage. As ever, tag us in your posts on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. We are at Doha Debates. And make sure you use that hashtag, Dear World, so I can find your comments easier. Rida. Thanks so much, Nell. Uh, obviously, a hugely consequential and important topic and issue of discussion for so many people around the world. So we do hope that we'll get lots of reactions online and from you here in the audience. But how did we get to this point? Let's take a quick look. All over the world, people are taking to the streets in protest. Their demands are varied, but they have at least one thing in common. They're fed up with their governments. The public's trust in government is collapsing. Let's break that down. Globally, just one in five people think the system is working for them. Now let's take a look at the United States. Only 3% of Americans trust their government to do what is right just about always. And a whopping 14% trust the US government to do what's right most of the time. 
Justified or not, the shrinking confidence in governments around the world is pushing people to other options. In Hong Kong, over a million citizens don't trust the Chinese government to respect its autonomy. They've been protesting in the streets for months, demanding a more democratic system. This lack of trust has led to a lot of frustration and problems, but it's also pushed people to find technological solutions. Instead of trusting a single third party, like a bank, cryptocurrency trusts a decentralized third party. Of course, there is always the option of rebuilding our trust in governments. In 2014, activists occupy Taiwan's legislature to protest a potential trade deal. The government responded by working with a hacker community called GovZero to create an app which lets users debate issues relating to the digital economy. This digital democracy, can it be the way of the future? Whichever means we choose, it's going to be hard work. Do we trust each other enough to make it happen? Do we trust each other well enough? A big, big issue, the issue of trust. And of course, how do we get over this trade and trust deficit, I should say? We've got plenty to discuss. Our three guests are sitting right here on stage with me. Let's introduce them all to you. Tony Lane Cassidy, Brett Henning, Zaid Rad Al Hussein. These are our three speakers who will have plenty to offer by way of interesting ideas as to how we can actually deal with this phase. We also have with us Govinda Clayton, he is our connector. Dr. Govinda Clayton is a senior researcher in peace processes within the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. Dr. Clayton's research interests include negotiation, mediation, conflict management, and civil war. As our connector, Dr. Clayton will provide guidance on identifying common ground and steering towards bridge building and consensus. So it's good to have you all with us here, Dr. Govinda Clayton, of course, all of our three speakers. Fernando, let's begin. Our first speaker, Tony Lane Casserly, is from the United States. An early pioneer in blockchain, Tony co-founded Culture, a movement to transform government into networks of communities beyond borders. Trust in government, or for that matter, any major monolithic institution, is at an all-time low because these organizations fail to serve the people they are meant to represent. When I was in school, I studied political theory and became disillusioned. We are no longer living in the Aristotelian model of citizen and state. We have more power voting with our credit card than we do in a national election. I became engaged in technology because technology represents something innately human, an idea. But we must remember that these ideas are themselves human. Technology is a tool, and tools endure based on the people who use them and the values that they hold. Blockchain technology has an extraordinary promise to eliminate middlemen that are gerrymandering trust out of the hands of individuals who need to own their own sovereign rights. If you are living in a country that does not allow you to love the person that you want to love legally, and could even enforce your being with the person you want to be with with acts of heinous criminal violence. The blockchain allows you to register these contracts anonymously or pseudo-anonymously on a distributed ledger where they can be verified by networks of communities. Communities that you decide you trust. But at the end of the day, we are a sovereign humanity. And the tools that we use do not need to be connecting with our devices over connecting with each other. If we want any of these tools to be effective, 
we need to remember what is so deeply important about merely being human. That is why we no longer trust government, because it does not have the humanity required to move the world forward. Thank you. Our second speaker, Brett Hennig, is the Australian co-founder and director of the Sortition Foundation and the author of The End of Politicians, Time for a Real Democracy. Trust in all forms of government all over the world is at historic lows. But that's not a bad thing, because there's still some trust. And I believe that societies can thrive with low levels of trust as long as governments engage in new ways of listening to the people and then, of course, act on what they say. Because as we've just heard, governments exist to serve the people, right? In democracies, that responsiveness is theoretically achieved by voting. The folk theory of democracy has that the voter goes up and they read all the policy preferences of all the parties and they look at which party has uh, the closest correspondence with their aspirations and they vote for that person, that, that party. It doesn't happen like that in practice, of course. But even in the most ruthless autocratic regime, they must spend quite a bit of energy making sure that the general population thinks that what they are doing is for the greater good of everyone. Apparently, the North Korean preamble to its constitution even says that the leader thinks serving the people is heaven. And perhaps this fact that no government is absolutely free to do exactly what, anything that it likes is why there's still some level of trust. Governments should provide basic services, and they've got to make sure there's enough food on enough plates. Otherwise, you will see thousands, perhaps uh, millions of people in the streets like we're seeing around the world today. Now, some governments have realised that there's very low levels of trust in what they're doing, and they're looking at these new ways of engaging with citizens. Right, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Right here in France, after months of the, the Gilets jaunes, the Yellow Vest protest against a tax uh, hike on fuel, the Macron, President Macron is now bringing together a randomly selected representative bunch of people in a citizens' assembly to discuss how France can address climate change in alternative ways. Another example is in Scotland, with the Brexit car crash on the horizon, like who knows what's going to happen there, the Scottish government thought we have to think about Scotland's future. But they knew that people wouldn't trust the government itself to come up with an unbiased proposition. So what did they do? They have randomly selected a representative bunch of people and brought them together in a citizens' assembly to talk about the future of Scotland. What about Extinction Rebellion, the global climate protest movement uh, that's demanding urgent action on the climate crisis? Uh, they hit the streets all over the world over a month ago. What's their third demand? That governments should be led by citizens' assemblies, representative samples of the people on how they address the climate emergency. So that, to me, is why citizens' assemblies are the way that societies can thrive with low trust in government. And who knows, there's already been 100 citizens' assemblies around the world, more or less. If that becomes thousands and tens of thousands, and the opportunity comes for some sort of regime change or system change, maybe we'll learn to do politics differently, and maybe we'll do politics via citizens' assemblies. Thanks. Our third speaker, Prince Said Ra'ad Al Hussein of Jordan, is a former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and veteran diplomat. A friend of mine said to me recently that the key to harmonious relationships between individuals lies in the art of making small adjustments. I believe this is also the case with governments and good governance. Now, sure, we can be attracted by, seduced even, by revolutionary thinking. I mean, after all, we're in the city that hosted one of his, history's greatest revolutions. And we heard just now about uh, blockchains, about trusted networks, about politicians who should be selected or 
uh, randomly selected as opposed to being elected. And these ideas are attractive, we need to consider them, but I'm not sure we need to adopt them. Because, simply put, if we take one of them, trusted networks, what could be more trusted than the network of a family, an extended family? So I want to try a little test on all of you. How many of you come from functional families? You know, harmonious relationships with all the different members of the family, no divorces, no one's upset with anyone else. Raise your hands if you come from a fully functional family and don't lie. <laughs> all right, hands down. What about the dysfunctional families? Mm, come on. I know some of you hear what your backgrounds are. No, the point being, <laughs> the point being is that harmony is difficult to achieve even amongst the most trusted of networks. Now, all of us agree that we need better political leadership globally. All of us. You know. But wouldn't this be achieved if the young go out to vote? Had the young voted in the UK in June of 2016, or in the US in uh, November of 2016, wouldn't the situation in those two countries be markedly different from where we are now? Now, in some countries, they make voting mandatory. What about if we made it universal? Everyone has to vote, except we put a cap. Voting ends at age 65, because most of those who've lived to age 65 have basically lived their active lives. Thank you very much. See you later. Go this way. <laughs> what we need is the young, the courageous, the smart, sort of passionate people, not just to take part in uh, elections, but also to stand for political office, to believe in their leadership. Because once they do, they've already crossed that Rubicon. And we will see better trust in government. We will see societies thrive uh, such is the power and elegance of the art of practicing small adjustments. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to all of our three spe speakers. You've now heard from each one of them some radical ideas, some less so. So while you ponder and think about who you might actually give your votes to, let me just quickly recap some of the statements we just heard. So we first heard from Tony, she believes that governments do not move humanity forward. Tony is pretty much done with government. She says we need change. She believes that bo blockchain and technology will help us actually build communities outside of the nation state. We need to create new governing systems. We also heard from Brett. Now, he says we don't have to give up on government altogether. They can still stick around and provide some basic uh, services and security. But what mu we must do is, in a way, go back to ancient times and think about citizens' assemblies. He believed that we need to have people randomly selected do the jobs of politicians. And then finally, Zaid, you just heard, arguing for small steps. Let's not shake the boat. Yes, there is some lack of trust in government, but let's keep governments because without them, societies will essentially unravel. So which one of these perspectives do you most identify with? Now is your time to tell us. It's time to vote. We need your input to find common ground among the speakers. We want to know exactly how much value you attach to the arguments you've heard. You have a total of 100 points to divide. You can divide them over one, two, or all three statements. To do so, simply assign points to the statements on a sliding scale. So now, while everyone here in the audience and online is actually busy putting in those votes, what are you hearing? What are people saying about trust in governments and other institutions? We have quite a few watch parties. This is now a thing that Doha Debates does. People gathering together, watching the debates and the speakers, and commenting on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. A couple that I want to share with you right now. We've had a really interesting one from a watch party in Sweden. Sanaz Habibi says, in Sweden, it depends on who you ask. Generally, there is a high trust in governments and institutions. However, the spread of misinformation, so fake news, which has been a real issue in 2019, uh, is a problem. We've also got 
got Ciala uh, Hersa from Mexico City. She's commenting that she says, we need, all the politicians, I imagine, need to learn empathy. That seems to be an important word. Money and power is not everything in the world. You are the ones that are supposed to lead us on, she says, how to be better citizens. And the only thing that you do is divide. So quite powerful feelings about division, about unity and empathy. And just one more, Rida, if I've got time, uh, that I want to take you to. We had uh, Kenneth Prudom, I hope I've pronounced that right, uh, on Twitter. And uh, Kenneth says, Doha debates, I say you go with something new. We've seen how bad, let's say, uh, the world can be when it's controlled by rich, old, white men. Let's give the young people a chance to make things better. And I'm surrounded behind me by young people. I wonder what they have to say. Rida? And I think I know which question this will be asked to whom. <laughs> Someone sitting with us on stage. But I do believe that we now have our results. So let's uh, look on the screen here behind me and see what we've got. Which one of these positions garnered the most vote? Well, it is the last one. Rebuild trust in government by improving the quality of leadership. And that was Zaid's perspective, 65%. <laughs> give up on government and create governing systems on blockchain. Tony, you've got still quite a bit of convincing to do, 10%. And Brett's position there, replace government with randomly selected people, surprisingly or perhaps not, hasn't really caught fire, 23%. So let's see what we can do next in the next stage of this debate. Welcome to the Mejlis, a traditional Arab consensus building practice. The focus of the Mejlis is to welcome critical conversations and reach solutions. Kida will encourage our speakers to bridge differences and find common ground. All right, so we are going to attempt to find common ground. I'm not going to promise anyone. And we will actually uh, you know, invite you to join us in this conversation a little later in the program. But let's first off begin the conversation here on stage. Uh, Zaid, you just heard Brett there say a few moments ago that, you know, any random person could have done the job you do. That, you know, there's no longer any need for, ra for politicians or veteran <laughs> diplomats like yourself. How does it make you feel? How do you look back on your life, on your whole career, knowing this? You know, in a strange way, I agree with him. <laughs> um, because you have to see someone who has a passion for their work. And if that person doesn't exist, in the job that they're occupying, then another means of finding people who will uh, basically represent the interests of communities needs to be thought of. So I, I, I Are like you saying the that idea. Brett would do a better job than most politicians. No, no, you know? I, I like his idea. I think the, the weakness in the idea, and perhaps he can address it, is that if someone who is randomly selected is not doing a good job and then is questioned about it, they'll say, well, I never wanted the job in the first place and I was randomly selected. It's like jury duty, and you hate doing it, and you're not passionate about it. And, and that's the weakness as I see it. And, I, and if you can answer that, I might be a convert, I, <laughs> but not yet. Can you answer that? How random is your random selection process? Can you force people into doing it if they're not interested? So it's not mandatory at the moment. All citizens' assemblies that have happened to date have been voluntary, of course. Uh, if we institutionalise citizens' assemblies, would they become mandatory? That's an interesting question. Um, of course, it's not about replacing single individuals. It's about randomly selecting a broadly representative bunch of people in an informed environment, deliberative, where you actually get people uh, explaining why they think the way they do. And this is bridging gaps and bringing these divisions, uh, these divided societies together. But in Brett, a very let's not be too diplomatic. Sorry. Now, you're playing the role of the diplomat. Yep. If you had the choice, would you replace the Zaids of this world? I yeah. mean, listening to you, you might even think that by now we would have all had uh, world peace if we had fewer aides and veteran diplomats and politicians and more random people. Now be careful how you answer this. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, that would be... Uh, <laughs> I think if uh, our parliaments and our legislatures were full of randomly selected people in a very structured, a differently structured environment, that, yeah, we potentially would be, wouldn't be in the position we are now, that's for sure. Tony, and if it were up to you, would any of these two men still have their jobs, or would you do, well, do away I, altogether with government? And you know, I think the problem is that we are necessitating the notion of work and saying that if we have change, people are going to lose jobs. 
and this is a fear mentality. This is immediately people saying that change is going to disempower people, and I don't know what's going to happen, and so I'm afraid. But what if we had something really simple? Like, for example, um, if you see a problem, you solve a problem, and that enables people around the world to develop more trust for each other and also to develop more skills. There is a pothole in the road, and everyone around can tag that pothole, and that can be sent out to every person who consents to receive information about that problem. And people on the ground with qualifications can actually be engaged and solve that problem directly with their local community and with their local city structure. Um, I don't think there should be fear in change, but rather slow and steady evolution toward growth to create a more dynamic and harmonious connection for all people. So, so let me ask you, Zaid, I mean, one sense is fear in change when you speak because you advocate small incremental steps. Other people are talking about radical change. Just look at the people on the streets of all these countries. They don't sure. want small baby steps. You want to simply change the players. Brett wants to change the players and the game. Yes, no, I, I mean, I, qu I quite understand that. And I, c I can see where uh, Tony's going with this. I mean, if I have a plumbing problem in my house in New York and there's a plumber that I trust in Amman who has the right uh, skills to teach me over the internet how to do this and then I solve my problem because in the local community there isn't such a person, I understand it. But in terms of governance, it just doesn't work because you have governments closing down, the shutting down the internet for two or three days before they have elections where nothing is transacted. And, and so ultimately... people want to change these governments. You're saying, let's keep the system. Can you get better but leaders with the same systems? That's, well, yes, you could, but the system still has to re rely on some governance. Uh, if governments shut down the internet in particular parts of a country or in a country, then the tech approach to this collapses very quickly. Uh, what I'm proposing is not little steps. It's actually, it's the empowerment of young people to realize it's their future. It's not pe the future of people who are 65 and older. And the fact that in many countries, the levels of apathy are high amongst uh, youth, they just don't feel, and this is part of the symptom that we're trying to deal with, it needs to be changed. And if they are running for office, and they are, as we see now, in the streets of many capitals around the world, things happen. Uh, Omar Hassan al-Bashir left office. We have uh, Evo Morales is leaving the country. And you don't often and get better replacements, do you? Well, not unless the message is loud and clear that the same old cannot work, that we, don't, we cannot afford to have the same approach to governance. We need to end discrimination. We need to end deprivation. We can't run countries on fear. And if those basic ingredients are satisfied, people, I think, will feel more trust in governments and they'll feel they have a better future. And we can use some of these things. So, so Brett, I mean, there's, uh, there's a point there as well that goes to the heart of trusting. Trusting people with expertise, with skills, with knowledge. Uh, you're saying we don't need all of that. We just need to build trust with randomly selected people. But let me just ask you, if you needed open heart surgery today and I went out on the streets and got you a bunch of randomly selected <laughs> would-be medics, uh, would you feel very comfortable no, putting your, not. your very, life in their hands? Yeah, there's a very different uh, skill set there about uh, a speci specifically technical question who uh, you have ultimate power over. You can decide whether you have that open heart surgery or not. But when it comes to governance, that's a different thing. They're the group of people that potentially have power over you. So uh, when it comes to a collective decision making like that, sure. Um, sure, but you're saying it's not a skill. So, no, so Zaid could have uh, spent his life studying something else, perhaps. It's a skill. Uh, I'm not, hmm. you're, you're killing me. <laughs> 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 My poor mother. <laughs> All the time. The other, don't you just wish? The other misconception about the Citizens Assembly is that it's not informed by experts. So they typically go through an information phase, a deliberation phase, and a decision phase. And how you have those experts who are on tap but not on top, as they say. Um, so it is an informed environment where people deliberate uh, and, and come to their final decision. But no, I wouldn't randomly select a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's good to know. But Tony, we're talking about uh, distribution, right? And so it's something you often talk about, that we need more people, uh, a system that is more inclusive. Your argument is that blockchain does that. I don't know how many people understand blockchain. I mean, for me, it is still science fiction. Can we get a show uh, of hands? Let's have a show of hands. How many of you actually understand oh, like blockchain and have access to that system and have worked with it? Oh, goodness. Not very okay. many. How many of you own bitcoins? or other cryptocurrencies. Well, I'm not Same in the minority, that's good to see. Okay. All right, okay. So, so still, aren't you playing into 
the argument that would say that you are advocating for a very elitist uh, system of governance by its very nature. Look, it is not accessible to the masses. Just look at the people here. Well, I would say that there's a learning curve. So every radical change that's ever happened in society, it doesn't happen from the mainstream. It happens because there's an outlier, because it takes an outlier to shift the curve of the way things happen. I wasn't aware about the knowledge gap here um, in blockchain. So basically, blockchain is a distributed ledger that is owned and run by no one. There is no central authority in blockchain technology. So there's no need for a middleman to execute a transaction. So rather than me saying, I'm going to send money to you, and I'm going to need a bank, to tr I'm going to need to trust a bank to send that money. It eliminates the trust for the, it eliminates the need for the middleman. It's the same thing with governments. Governments are literally s deciding right now whether or not someone exists. And the government does actually have the ability, if they don't like the way that you live or the way that you work or the color of your skin, if government wanted to, they could literally say, okay, we will take away your birth certificate and your identity documents and you no longer have citizenship here because we don't like the way that you think. We don't like the way that you think. We don't like the way that you look. Um, we can take away your, your rights. And in blockchain, you cannot do this because you do not need a central authority to execute something like an identity contract, to execute something like a marriage license to your land titles in countries like Sierra Leone. The government is actually selling land that has been owned by families for eight generations to China. So these families of local people are innocently sitting in their homes to have a bulldozer run through the middle of their house in the middle of their day without ever having the opportunity to even remotely consent to that. Blockchain sure, sure, eliminates the need sure, for government can to do that. can the very same system that you advocate actually be used against you because of the lack of structure, legal infrastructure? You could devise your own laws, whereas someone like Zaid would argue as human rights chief, as you were uh, many years ago, uh, for a few years, just a couple of years ago, in fact, uh, you worked on breaking down all the discrimination that uh, people face, the human rights abuses. Is that a good idea, what Tony is advocating here? Blockchain uh, takes care of this. It, it could do, because I, I think it'd be wrong to say it's categorical, it's either this or that. I mean, it could do. I think ultimately there is some authority. We, all of this is powered from the electric grid. Uh, there is an authority that can switch it on, switch it off. Uh, and it, you, you, at, at the very base, you have you know, designers of algor algorithms. Now, clearly, blockchain, as, as uh, Tony was saying, has its own internal logic, which is appealing. Uh, the, but the overall danger is still exists that in the hands of weak leadership, how these technologies progress uh, could be very much decided if the context is a bad one. And, and we don't have the right leaderships, then these technologies will not flower into something positive. So the main thing is not to find the substitute now. The main thing is to elect into governments that are consequential, especially those that have an effect on the entire planet in terms of the regulation and how we approach climate change and everything else, that the elections there have to incorporate the youth. And if that happens, I think you will find that we are in a much better situation globally. Uh, can I ask? Half of the world? Yeah, go, go, go. Well, <laughs> go ahead, Brad. What about the half of the world that doesn't have elections, though? Uh, this is also an issue. 50% of the world is run by dictatorship. That's true. Uh. That's true. But uh, there are only certain governments where the elections are so consequential, it affects peace and security, it affects humanitarian work, it affects everything else. It's not to say that other countries are not important, no. but the, the, the effects of a crisis are not centrifugal. Mm. If we have a crisis in the United States, or in China, or in Russia, or in the European Union, it is deeply consequential to the rest of the world. Yeah. Okay, Brad, let me ask you this. I mean, we heard Zaid, in his world, our world, we know what we're expecting. You know, there's a sense of familiarity, there are laws and antitrust laws. There's a certain protection. In Tony's world, each one of us would be completely sovereign, independent. We'd codify our own laws. In your world, going back to this ancient uh, Greek history of the 6th century, where would we be and who would actually pick the metrics of representation? What would it be based on? So I don't want to go back to ancient Athens where there were slaves. How, so and who, how would you pick your assembly? <laughs> I mean, just to get that clear. Um, <laughs> uh, at the moment when they do these events, and there's been hundreds of them around the world, they typically make sure that you have half men, half women in the room. You make sure you have lots of young people because you uh, just match the census data. You just get a 
demographic sample according to age. Typically also say education level, which is used as say, a proxy for uh, rich and poor, essentially. So you make sure that the room is full of people like you and me, which is why people trust citizens' assemblies. But who makes those decisions and who will tell you when the assembly is representative enough? So at the moment, it's uh, essentially four or five uh, demographic categories. So it's represented in the sense of age, gender, geography, sometimes ethnicity, um, and you match the uh, demographic data and you bring that group of people in. When they did this in Ireland and they talked about the constitutional ban on abortion, they came up with their conclusions which were then put to a referendum. And the people who had heard about the Citizens' Assembly, they trusted uh, the output uh, of that Citizens' Assembly. All right, well, let's head to our connector, Govinda. Govinda, you've been listening to these statements. Are we heading anywhere interesting? Are we heading towards anarchy? How do you oh, think well, it's, it's certainly interesting, that's for sure. But in conflict resolution practice, when we're trying to find common ground, we try and encourage people to move from their positions to instead address those underlying interests. So it's moving from what we want to what the reason is that underlies that. And so, so far, the discussion has really been dominated by the positions of whether the right approach it relates to blockchain or citizens' assemblies and the like. But I think underlying all of those positions is a common interest from everybody, that we need new approaches in order to better connect normal, everyday people with the centres of political power. And so what I would do is invite each of the speakers now to, instead of speaking about why your approach is perhaps the preferred or more effective means, to instead speak to the different complementarities and the way in which the different approaches you're suggesting might complement each other in different ways and offer a more general solution to the ways in which we can better connect people and power. So, so there is hope in that these three different perspectives can actually be bridged. There's always hope. There's always <laughs> hope. But Zaid, when you talk about the system as it is, and you seem to want to hold on to it, you say you want leaders with integrity, with a moral compass. One can argue, and I've known you for many years as a journalist, that you were one such leader within the UN system. But let's face it, you did not last very long. No. Why would you want to hold on to this system? <laughs> I know, it sounds like I'm a masochist or something, I, why, in, involved in self-harm. No, I, I think the thing is, any jarring over-exaggeration usually, usually creates effects that in the beginning we don't anticipate and later become deeply uh, harmful to us. And I think there's a time and place for all of this. At the moment, we need to arrest the sharp deterioration and we need to elect the right people into the office that they uh, uh, are entitled to lead. Now, entitled by virtue uh, of their knowledge, uh, what they represent, uh, the sort of the, the rights of all peoples, not just a certain category of peoples. Um, but again, is what is the right person, though? Again, isn't this an elitist approach? Because no. that's one of the main problems we see around the world, here in yeah. France and other places, yeah. where people, your average person, yeah. feels that the elite doesn't think they're good enough no. to make important decisions. Exactly. No, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, the, the thing is, in all countries, you have structural discrimination. There is a minority somewhere that is being discriminated against, perhaps not in law, but when you, can get, you reach the point of extension of services, you have that. If you have a leader who actually cares about all their people, genuinely cares about all their people, it is a major step forward. And if we can do that, and we can end the deprivation, the austerity measures, the way that people are treated at the, minor at the margins of, of society, things will change. And then there is a role for thinking about uh, what it is that Brett is putting forward and also what uh, Tony is thinking. I mean, they're not Zaid, mutually exclusive, I think. have you bought into what Zaid has been uh, talking about? And while I ask you the question, uh, hold your thought for just a second while I tell everyone in the audience that we would welcome your thoughts, observations, and, and quick questions. So there are two mics on either side of this hall. If you just make your way to them, I'll call on you in just a couple of seconds. So do you buy into any of this? Um, I'd just like to ask a basic question, um, which is, do either of you think that we can continue to keep government as we know it in its current form or even in an evolved form without committing mass murder? Uh, yes. Uh, that's a tough one. That's, that's <laughs> just, to, just to throw out there, war is, I mean, other than mosquitoes, if government is one of the single most violent organizations in the world. And while we talk about government, we're talking about government as though government is a citizen vote. A citizen vote happens once every four years or at a different time period if you're living in a different country. 
most of what happens in government is not about citizens, nor does it include citizens. And a lot of those actions are actions of violence at times against innocent civilians, um, at other times for resource war or to fragment democratic uprising to preserve a sense of false power. So is it possible to keep government um, without acts of violence? Is that, is that even feasible at, at this stage so very quick of life? Before I go to a yeah, I mean, it, you're right in th saying that there's an implied violence within the constitutional frame of most governments, that the laws have to be obeyed. If they're not obeyed, then, then violence would be used. But it's wrong to think that we can do without law and without law that, can, that no, needs to be not. enforced. Because if we don't have law, we are set loose on one another, and we will tear each other apart, You're and we know that. Aren't you? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it, it, it has to be a, a, a perspective like that, but that we can improve government, I think certainly we can do that, and using some of the thinking that we've heard. All right, let's see what our audience thinks. Let me ask you to quickly introduce yourself, and in a sentence or two, give us your question. Um, hi, I'm Tasneem. I'm a first-year student at Qatar University. Um, so my question is for Tony. Uh, tech has allowed for a lot for a certain amounts of progress but it also has a lot of implications of exploitation within communities so how can we create a technological system that mitigates harm to people and that actually helps people prosper and has accountability of some kind yeah, first to yep yeah, very good question first people to actually yeah, take over and manipulate the system especially blockchain drug cartels money launderers i think there are so that's a complete the whole uh, I'm not even going to go into that because that's the myth. That's the myth of innovation. People who fear change immediately go into fear mongering and say this is used for evil purposes um, through trust, through networks of trust. So if you, rather than taking power and putting it into a central authority and saying the central authority verifies me and in verifying me, I now have this kind of authority or ability or access. You are verified by local individual members of your community in the same way that you might. Wouldn't it be more productive to actually give people accreditation for skills or ways that they can improve than it would be to simply like someone's photo over and over and over and over and over again on Instagram? Um, so it's, it's, it works very similar to a principle of something like social networks and set, instead of using a social network to fuel addictive behaviors, you're actually using human interaction to fuel trust. But importantly, I really want to stress, technology cannot be the solution if we do not have humanity. We must regain our connection with each other. And if we can use technology as a tool to reconnect with each other and rebuild trust in each other and gain empathy and understanding for each other, then technology will be good. But can but you that's control the take, system though? That will take all of us standing up right. to have more consideration for each other. There's the question of accountability though in a system that you cannot you, control. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so happy to answer. Very briefly. Okay. Okay, we'll take another question first. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Zahan. I'm an international security master's student. Uh, hearing from the three Thank speakers, you. empowering communities and giving people a voice seems to be a common threat. Uh, threat. In what way has the internet and social media led to the breakdown of trust and the proliferation of disinformation? Oh. All right. I, I think I you'll go? take that, Tony. So and that's my first career correct. was media, and it, I, I have seen directly the spread of this in, in such a heinous and horrible way. And actually one of the first, I've given a few speeches on this, of using um, incentivized information networks that can allow whistleblowers to anonymously, similar to the way something like uTorrent or Napster works, except that you're actually doing this with anonymous whistleblowers that are submitting information that they've gained to a public forum for journalists to use. And then journalists are able to be compensated individually for, um, you know, journalists and the person who's provided the information are able to be compensated for the way that that information spreads and proliferates without revealing the whistleblower identity through anonymous networks like cryptocurrency. Um, so I think in order to, rather than, there, there's, there's a huge conversation about preventing the spread of misinformation. Um, and I think a lot of that can be empowered with, um, by giving people more freedom to um, say what they need to say without being at risk of political violence. All right, let's take another quick question. Hi, um, I'm Beatrice, Lithuanian, studying at Northwestern University in Qatar. So we're a generation that is running out of time and building trust takes time. How do we find solutions of gaining trust that will work, work right now? And if, change, if we change the system, how do we know we can trust the new system? Brett, you wanna take that? Measures that work today. 
They're already working. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> the citizens' assemblies are happening all around the world. In uh, Ostbelgian, in the German-speaking region of Belgium, from September, they've just set up a permanent, randomly selected citizens' council alongside the elected parliament. This is a system happening today. People can compare randomly selected citizens' council with an elected chamber. And I think uh, this can happen anywhere. Citizens' assemblies can happen on, the, on a city level, on a regional level, on a national level. Um, who knows? Even, even larger. Another question. My name is Vera Jonstotter. I'm an Icelandic student studying here in Paris. I believe my question goes for all three of you. And I want to ask you, as a young woman, since women are hugely underrepresented in the realm of politics and in the realm of uh, government, which model do you think best represents... <laughs> <laughs> which model do you think best re represents our interests and which government can we trust? Also, also young people are vastly underrepresented. If you look at the uh, graph of age versus gender for the UK governmental system, it's ridiculously overbalanced towards old men, of course. So how do we get young voices in? How do we get women's voices in? You actually randomly select a representative sample of people. Wow, <laughs> you got 50%. It really works. Yeah. Zaid, is the other way to vote and to run for office? Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's precisely, the, if, you, if you have the right atmospherics that encourage you to be activist, I mean, the only difference between a leader who's young and someone who's just young is that the leader has decided to shed fear. That's the only difference. You shed fear, you begin to lead. You are fearful of consequences, repercussions, what society will say, what community, the hate mail will start coming in, you're never going to lead. And you have it within you. The young have it within you to be courageous. And so there isn't an identifiable system where you can say, Iceland, I mean, maybe Iceland is. I think Brett's right to say that you have to be cautious here. But what is clear is that when you go to countries around the world, the youth are pulsating with energy. They just have to shed fear and begin to command. I and I think, think that's the case. Just shed fear, fear and I begin to systemic. play a part within the system. <laughs> You say it's systemic. I think it's systemic. And I think um, for, uh, I mean, women in the UK have had the vote for 100 years. They've finally got to say 30% of the vote, 30% uh, of the electorate. Um, yeah, to me, we can't wait another 100 years and to get Tony, another. Well, what can we do in your world? I mean, Zaid obviously wants you, people like you, young well, women and men, to, to vote and to run for office, would you? I also want to call to attention that it has to... I mean, a couple of things I want to call to attention that you want to have to be 55 to run for president of the United States, that you, the United Nations appointed Saudi Arabia as a representative of women's rights when women weren't legally allowed to drive a car, and that... Um, but yeah. you just had the and youngest member of Congress the, in the United States. And that the... Yeah, so um, that the... Blockchain technology actually empowers women that are living in situations where there's an intense amount of political conflict, um, like Afghanistan, where there's conflict from the Taliban, to have access to financial privacy when they're at risk of having acid thrown on their face or being beaten for merely owning the rights to their own money. Um, there's an or organization uh, called the Digital Citizen Fund, and it is teaching young women to code in Afghanistan um, to basically give them liberation from a extremely politically tense climate, and uh, blockchain technology allows them to own their own money in a way that is completely financially private, and is they're able to transact through the internet, so their money cannot be taken or stolen from them in the same way that so many of their rights have. So you wouldn't run for office? Um, <laughs> I think that would be, an, yeah, I've been asked that question actually. Um, no, I think that's uh, counterproductive to the goal, but I do think that there are many ways for, if we want to be a change in the world, I think there are many ways to do that. We don't need to be in a system. We can be the system. We can build the system. All right. Another question. Uh, my name is T. I currently go to the American University of Paris as an international comparative politics student. Uh, I see the potential of blockchain to create a decentralized form of governance. However, one of the current worries of blockchain is that the powerful can remain powerful because blockchain requires expensive compu computer components, which takes money to obtain. So in a scenario where there is a blockchain form of governance, what is there in place to prevent the powerful from retaking control of that form of governance that would be in place? Yeah, definitely. And I think this is an answer that is still being... The 
really interesting thing about the moment in time that we're in is that the systems are literally still being built. Like blockchains are being launched all of the time. We just had a major blockchain, blockchain launch like less than a year ago. And the original launched, you know, 11 years ago. And so that's the fascinating thing about these systems is that if you want to be involved in creating governance processes of the future, all you literally have to do is go online and actually contribute work. That's all you have to do to participate in these ecosystems is contribute work. When you contribute work, you get a form of accreditation, you get community recognition, and then you're actually able to be a part of the process. So if you think you know how to design a better government and a better governance structure than the one we have today, these systems are literally in this tipping point of where they're being built. They are so new and there is such a vast opportunity for people to get involved in creating the structures that will actually it will actually are, have influence on the future. I don't want to say I know the future and that's what will happen, but um, every major government in the world and every major organization, the largest organizations in the world are all investing into this technology. But obviously there are risks. There's a lot of unknowns, as you say. Yeah. The rich can get richer, the powerful can get more powerful because it can concentrate power and wealth in the hands of a few. Just a thought, but let's see what else we've got in the audience. Hello, I'm Zoe Ansel and I'm a 10th grader at the International School of Paris. And my question is for um, Zaid, and it is, with trust at such low levels around the world and the refugee and human rights crisis only worsening, do you still believe in the value of an organization such as the UN? <laughs> uh, how many million people are watching this? <laughs> <laughs> and it is a 75-year-old organization. It is a Look, the, the UN, I, I've said this publicly before, the UN is only as great or as pathetic as the world is out there. It's not going to be you know, great if the world is in a pathetic state, and it's not going to be pathetic if the world is in a great state. It's a reflection of the world. The UN is the world. I mean, when we look at, for instance, issues of trust, the UN in an, an analog form is exactly that. It's a network of people, who, in civil society, governments, all walks of life, all nationalities, all religions working together. And we cannot perfect harmony. And that's why I'm a bit cautious about what it is that Tony's saying. I mean, if we have a world that's bifurcated, you know, two 5G orbits, one led by China, the other led potentially by Europe and the US, and it's bifurcated. And then what are we talking about? The system is collapsing. We don't really have time. We need to elect people quickly, the right people. And then we will have the space to see and address all these issues that I think are important. I think what Tony's saying and what Brett's saying are really important. As for the UN, I, if it doesn't quickly make itself relevant for much of the rest of the world, I think it is in danger of collapsing. Yeah. Is it in danger of collapsing or has it pretty much collapsed in terms of its moral Okay. bankruptcy. I mean, aren't you just again protecting the status quo when Steve Jobs once said uh, that, for example, it is the people who he called the crazy ones, the misfits, the troublemakers, right? The, uh, the, the crazies, the rebels, they're the ones who push the human race forward because of his, their ideas. You want to keep the status quo. Brett and Tony want to push humanity forward. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, you're killing me. Yeah. What no, do you say <laughs> No, I, I want to preserve parts of the status quo now because I think things are sliding in a direction which is so dangerous that we can't afford to experiment. What we need is to stabilize the ship before it capsizes. Once we've stabilized it, we can decide whether we move to a new ship and then what technologies we need in that new ship. And that's where I'd sit and have you know, Tony and Brett as my consultants. All right, let's see if that <laughs> ship <laughs> is worth saving, <laughs> fixing, gluing together. So Titanic. let's actually uh, test the water one more time and go to a second round of voting. And while we do, this is going to take a minute or two. We have uh, the organizer of the Nell? French Citizens' Assembly standing to ask the next question, actually. A very quick question, but I'm told we do have to go to our correspondent. Okay, so yeah, just sorry. a quick no, thought. I'm Antoine, working with Mission Publique, 20 years of experience with Citizens' Assembly. So we know they work. We know they work very well. But we know also that um, there is a question on governance that the blockchain... I want, I want to try to connect. But very quickly. Well, yes. So that uh, on the governance, there is a very important part, which is the social governance. And for that... At, at my thinking that Citizens' Assembly could be great to put on the governance of a blockchain. So you, we, you would have people governing that. Agree. 
But what we know is that leadership is very important. France, and if we had the scaling of deliberative democracy in France in February and now with the Citizens' Assembly, is because we had a leader that was convinced that it was a good idea. So I think there right. is something in this field. Connecting the dots, Govinda, you've got competition there. <laughs> All right, back to you, Nell. <laughs> Well, as to my good friend who couldn't stop but get his point across, uh, make sure you vote for your best idea. You guys online, thank you. What a dynamic, engaging debate we're having on Twitter. There are people shooting off on all sides. It's absolutely incredible. I've got so much to read you, I could probably spend the whole show, but I'm going to give you my highlights, Gerda. Are you ready? Yep. So we've got one from Jose Angel Lopez, and he says, to your point, people do not lose their trust in their leaders. It is the leaders who lose, who lose the connection with their people. And I think all three of of our speakers are talking about that in some capacity. The question is, where is that interlinking kind of connection between the three of them? Uh, moving on a little bit, we've got Miss Masadiq. Don't look at me, you lot vote. You know what it is, dohadsbates.com slash vote. I want to see what you guys think. And guys, remember, those of you watching on Twitter, you can vote to dohadsbates.com forward slash vote. I want to know what you think. Whilst you're doing that, I'm going to read you a few more questions uh, and comments. We've got one here from Nisma uh, Siddiqui from the UK, who says, honestly, Prince Saeed Z makes the most sense. The best way to rebuild trust in governments is through quality leadership. The problem today is that a lot of politicians don't serve citizens, but rather money and power. Those huge themes. Tony, a lot of people are sending you love. They're just being introduced to Tony's um, actual theory and ideas. So that seems to be a thing. People are just Googling blockchain uh, randomly and quickly, just to try and understand and learn. One more, Gerda. This one is really important. Thomas Ramirez in Mexico City again says, how can these solutions take into account minorities, like LGBTQ plus groups that are being persecuted in their home countries and aren't protected by their own people? That's a question to our speakers, Gilda. All right, thanks, Elle. Let's see if these thoughts and concerns and ideas have been reflected in the results of the second round of voting. So let's put up the first round, remind ourselves of who did best. Said, you'll be happy to see the numbers again. 65% for you. We can't freeze Tony. this. <laughs> well, let's see if it's changed. Let's see if you've got the chop of keeping your lead. Now, the second round of voting shows oh. us that, well, oh. you've been bummed down a little bit, oh. but you're still ahead. <laughs> oh. Rebuild trust in yeah, government pain. has echoed the most, I think, with people 60%. And then, Tony, you've come up slightly at 12%. And then uh, we've got Brett with 26%. All right, so with a couple of minutes left to us, just a quick few thoughts from each one of you. Uh, Brett, to you first. We heard one of your colleagues talk about how things can actually come together. Mm. Sortition, citizens' assemblies, could that be, could that be a happy marriage? Uh, the blockchain to uh, authenticate the, uh, the yeah. random selection, etc., yeah. of the uh, participants of a citizens' assembly, for sure. Um, yeah, and as for at the at the moment, we certainly need uh, leaders to step forward and say yes, uh, we are going to run a citizens' assembly. They have to, in some sense, it's a bit humility, a, a bit of humility, I guess, because you're saying we understand that there's low trust, so we're going to hand this over to a, a randomly set group of people. But yeah, I can see how that would. Come together nice. Tony, to you, final thoughts, one concrete piece of advice, if you had any, to help us live in today's world, not tomorrow's. Um, put down your phones and help a stranger, someone that you've never met before in your life. And I might just add, for someone who's so into uh, blockchain and new technology, you travel without a phone. Yeah, I, I, could, I don't, I I don't use my phone. I believe in human connection. I didn't even bring my phone to Paris at all. Uh. I don't travel with it. I don't use it because if technology is a tool, what makes technology and what is important is humans being good to each other. Be good to each other, you guys. Say it to you, governments clearly not beyond repair. The votes have shown that people still believe that we need governments to succeed. Yeah, we need governments, we need courts to work, we need courts to represent the interests of all parts of society, including the vulnerable uh, and the minorities who often are just excluded from the remit of, of government the way it exists. Uh, it's not too late, and I think there is a place for all of what we've heard. It's, these are not mutually exclusive as such, it's just a matter of phasing them in at the right time. So I think th this has been a successful majlis. I've taken part in many uh, many uh, majlis, we not always come to an agreement, as you know, in the Arab world, but, uh, but this has been good. 
All right, well, it's a good note on which to end. Zaid, Brett, and Tony, thank you so much for being with us. And, and a very big thank you to all of you here in the audience at the Paris Peace Forum, the students from France, from Paris, and from the Qatar Foundation. Thank you for being here and for taking part in this important debate. Let's continue this conversation, though, online. You can follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube as well. And if you want to watch any of the videos that we've put together, films and interviews and the likes, you can go to dohadebates.com. And of course, use the hashtag Dear World at Doha Debates to make a commitment. Tell us what you would do differently as we think of how best to move forward. From me, Rida Fakhri, and the whole Doha Debates team, thanks very much for being here. Thank you.